for a few moments, let's turn together to the passage that we read in Ezekiel chapter 36 and to pause a little at verse 26. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will give you a new heart. As we come to this passage, we are reminded here of a sense of transformation that is related to the life of faith. And when we spent time considering together from Ephesians, and we saw in chapter 2 of Ephesians how Paul speaks of faith as being a gift, that it is God who gives this gift to his people. And we understand as we study God's word that receiving the reception of this gift and embracing this gift is necessary in order for us to be saved. For our salvation, we need to lay hold of the gift of faith that God gives. And as we try and consider how this functions and how this operates, we know that the Bible teaches us what happens and what occurs. The language of the Bible is quite deliberate. It speaks of radical change, absolute and radical change, a true transformation occurring within a person. Jesus' own language in John chapter 3 captures this, of course, very well known, where he speaks of the new birth. And he tells us that unless we are born again, we cannot enter the kingdom of God. It is similar language that Ezekiel here records when he says I will, that God says to us, I will give you a new heart and remove the heart of stone from your flesh. It's followed, of course, too, in the New Testament by the Pauline language where Paul, uh, the apostle, speaks in these kind of terms, speaking of the believer becoming a new creation, a new creature, the, the change, the transformation of life. In our own use of, of how we understand faith and how we understand the Christian life, we use the term conversion. We speak of somebody who has become a Christian as somebody who has been converted. And that whole language, too, encapsulates for us that experience. Something has happened within a person. And we know that we cannot enter heaven unless we have such an experience, that this needs to happen to us. This radical change of life, this radical change of lifestyle, this complete and absolute transformation from within a person, in the depth of their soul and their being, such a transformation that changes our present and our eternal state, changes everything we are and changes how we think, how we feel, how we live, how we act, and where we are going. You must be born again. That if you are not born again, you will not enter into heaven. And we emphasize this truth constantly and continually. It speaks spoken of elsewhere as the old, old story. It's the same story. It's a story that you need to be born again. But we don't just need to be born again. We need to understand something about it. We need to be able to comprehend this great and mighty truth of Scripture. And we need to be able to communicate it also. Because we need to understand what has happened to us. If we are born again, we need to understand what actually happened. If we're to communicate and understand what we are and what we do. We need to understand the new birth. And if we're, you're not a Christian here today, you need to understand too, in order to comprehend what happens to a soul when this change occurs. For faith, we need to consider this 
Or if you are seeking faith, you need to consider this too. But also from our pulpits and from our mouths and from our walk and witness and who we are as Christians and as a church, this is the message we need to tell the world. This is the greatest message in the world. There is no message like this. You are absolutely privileged beyond your comprehension that you have grown up under the sound of this message. You must be born again. And the professing Christian and the professing church must not, must not devalue the reality and the necessity of this experience. That people need to be born again. Because this is how people are saved. We need to see and to realize that this is the power of God unto salvation. This is God's work. This is what God does. And we ourselves need to be faithful to this message and faithful to the words of Jesus. And we want to consider this this evening from how Ezekiel conveys this as a message of the radical heart change. This is, of course, closely related uh, to Jeremiah's message of the new covenant and Ezekiel's own message in chapter 11, in verse 19. I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. This is the consistent biblical message of the new birth. The new birth. Let us consider what Ezekiel says about the new birth and let us try and comprehend a little more of this for ourselves. I will give you a new heart. And he says that in the second part of this verse, I will remove the heart of stone. And what we have here is, first of all, this aspect of the stony heart. Of the hard heart. And scripture and life makes it obvious what we need. We can examine the world. We can examine God's word. We can examine ourselves. And we can ask what's wrong. And what's wrong is obvious. What is wrong is what is wrong within. This is the conclusion that we come to. And how we come to realize the reality of our own sin our own transgressions, our own trespasses, and to examine ourselves in the light of God's word, to examine ourselves in the light of our own lives and our own situations, and to recognize what sin has done. And Ezekiel here uses this metaphor to speak of what is wrong. He's saying that within the person is this heart of stone, that this is the kind of life and living that there is something here deeply amiss, that he is picturing here for us a person. And instead of that, that organ that we're so used to, that is so essential, that needs to operate in this way, to, is always active. This great organ that we are so dependent upon, that makes us alive, pumping blood through our body, moving constantly and continually, and what here the prophet is declaring to us is that this is not what he is seeing within us. Instead, he is seeing a heart of stone. The moment the heart stops, the person is no longer alive. And what is pictured here is this desperate and deplorable condition that there is something wrong. Instead of that active organ functioning correctly, there is this piece of stone. And of course, what he is utilizing here is the picture of metaphor. It is not that we are simply gravely ill. We're dead. This is how Paul speaks of it. He says we're dead in our trespasses and sin. We are dead. This is our natural condition. Jeremiah speaks of the heart in another way. He says it's deceitful above all things. It's desperately sick. This continual response of sin and transgression. And here in this chapter, the prophet has catalogued 
the continuing sin that consumes the people. A people of such privilege. A people who are under God's law and now under God's judgment. And what has brought their exile and what has brought their chastisement and judgment is their own sin. And the fact that they are not just sinning in ignorance. You remember how Paul speaks of himself as the chief of sinners. And then he says, I did it in ignorance. These people are not in ignorance. They have been brought up under the sound of God's law. In the call for obedience. This is a people who should have known better. But their lives are taken away in sin. Their life is in ruin because of their rebellion. They have chosen their own course in life. And what they've constantly done is follow their own hearts. Done what they feel like doing. Done the things that they want to do. And the whole entire problem with that is that the prophet is saying, but your heart is stone. Your heart is desperately sick. Your heart is wicked and filled with sin. The reality of the condition that belongs to a person by nature. That we're consumed with our own selfishness. We want to go our own course in life. We want to do our own things. And sin draws us in. And takes us down this path. It estranges us from truth. It causes us to be at enmity with God and rebellion to God. It brings us into shame. And to do all kinds of things that we ought not to do. We are following our hearts and our hearts are taking us all the way to our lostness. It's taking us down the wrong road. The natural enmity and rebellion because we're doing what our heart tells us to do. It is the abandon of God. And the abandon of of God brings the judgment of God. The selfishness is rebellion, leading us straight in to hell. He speaks of stony hearts. Is this not often how we find ourselves? It isn't just that we feel that our hearts are, are engaged in sin, but they become harder and harder. And maybe we blame life and we blame our experiences. And we say that life has made our hearts hard. And we see the desperate situation of our condition and of how the Bible is declaring lostness and God's judgment. And we ask ourselves, how then can we be saved? How can we escape the judgment of God? And what the Bible constantly tells us is that there is only one answer. Something needs to happen to us. Because we can't fix ourselves. We can't just simply self-reform. We can't just engage in some kind of moralizing of ourselves. We cannot ever be good enough. We cannot do enough. We cannot do this by ourselves. We cannot change our own hearts. It's beyond us. It is impossible. No amount of personal effort can achieve this. Something needs to happen to us. And so what he speaks of secondly is the new heart. And what the Bible is teaching us is that there is hope. There is salvation. There is a way of escape. And it is in Christ alone. And this is the need of the soul. This is your need and my need. Not simply that we know this truth. But that it hits home. That it becomes personal. That you would be converted. It's something that happens to us. It's a gift that is given. It's faith, it's spiritual life. It's here in the language that the sequel brings to you. I will give you a new heart. I'm going to take away this heart of stone and I'm going to give you a real heart, a heart of flesh, a heart that moves, a heart of activity, a 
heart that is not hard. You know, modern medicine, one of the great marvels is how organs are transplanted. Heart transplant is probably the most complicated of these. And it's a marvelous thing. It's way beyond anything in Ezekiel's day, something of modern times. The, the skill of the surgeon, the situation even of the patient, the reality of the condition, the defect, the decay in the heart, the problem, the risk to life. Being brought into the operating table, a donor is found. The match needs to be correct. Then the work goes on. The surgeon so skillfully moving everything and bringing the skill of taking one heart out, a defective heart and a new heart in and closing everything up. And the patient then recovering from the surgery, the major surgery, be restored to health. You know, in the operation there, it's the surgeon and his team that, that changes this heart. That performs this operation. You know what's going on with the patient. The patient's asleep. He's doing nothing. He's not there in the middle of it. Opening up his own flesh. Moving the organs. He's not doing anything like that. He's asleep. The only thing that he has contributed. Is the defect. Is the thing that's wrong. And here, when we consider this language and we consider what God is doing, it's this spiritual operation within the soul of a person where God is promising to change our hearts and to change our lives. And he's promising to do this. And the only thing that we contribute is the defect. It's God who operates. It's God who fulfills this. This is what we understand in the theological language of the new birth as regeneration. The radical transformation where we are made alive. We were dead. We're contributing nothing of any good. It is all of God. It is all of his work. It is the work of the Holy Spirit. Remember how it's recorded for us in John's Gospel. Truly, truly, I say to you on this... Someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus says, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time in his mother's womb and be born? Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. He is saying the spirit is at work here. Uh, Paul speaks of this, of course, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. Ephesians 2, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. He made us alive. Colossians 2, he says the same thing. God made us alive. Titus, he says, he saved us. 1 Peter chapter 1, you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. This is regeneration. This is the new birth. This is the work of God. Bringing life to this dead heart. To this dead soul. Imparting this gift. Enabling this person to be alive. To embrace Christ. To repent of their sin. To exercise this faith. You were dead. You were contributing nothing. And you have this experience this is radical. This is life changing. This is eternity changing. This is the gospel. There is no experience like this. It is beyond words, beyond explanation. There is nothing like this. It is not a simple emotional experience. It is not a religious ritual. It is not some self-reform. It is that God is at work in you. God working in your soul. God changing your heart and your life. God, God himself converting you. This is a wonder, Christian, that God has done this in your life. That God has done this for you. And you've brought nothing. You remember even 
Nicodemus' question, and you can imagine him there asking this question, puzzled, maybe even a little bit of humor there, where he is asking there, can a man enter his mother's womb again? And he speaks in this natural way. But even in a natural way, we did not ask to be born. We did nothing to be born. Our parents effected this. So with a spiritual birth, God does this. God does this. It's God's work. But what we need is clarity to understand, appreciate what has happened to us, to come to that great confirmation in our own mind, this is God. We, of course, have a duty in verse 27. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. Be careful to obey my rules. And this is telling us that we evidence if this is sincere. That is more than words because this radical change enables us to do things we were never able to do. To walk in this way, in his law, in his statutes. To do what is before this impossible. To walk with our God. To walk with our Savior. To live in a different way. To live in the pleasure of him. We were living in sin and rebellion. That's our natural state. But now this radical change manifests itself. Whatever you think of your Christian life, you know, you have to come to say this for yourself. I did not do this. I could not perform this change. This is God. This is a God at work in me. This is not myself. He speaks thirdly here in terms of the new life. We speak of the marvels of modern medicine, but there is nothing, nothing, nothing in all the world as marvelous as this. This is the most extraordinary thing in the whole world. That a person... A man, a woman, a boy, or a girl, they could be converted. This is absolutely amazing. To break the bonds of that stony heart, to turn away from that old life, to turn away from the sin and the rebellion, when the truth of God lays hold of you, when your eyes are open to see Christ, when your heart is changed in that radical way and you have new life, a new vision, a new purpose, a new heart. It's all new. The old has passed away. A new creation in Christ Jesus. There is nothing like this. This is the greatest experience that anybody could ever have. That we were dead. We were dead. We were not like the patient on the operating table asleep. We were dead. We were like Lazarus in the grave. And God has spoken. And the Lord has taken us out of our grave. And out of that death. And out of that stony heart. And out of that life of sin and rebellion, and he's called us to something new. To embrace the wonder of the marvel of this extraordinary experience. There is nothing like being born again. There is nothing like this experience. And it is so absolutely essential. Our longing and our desire is to be in heaven. He's saying here in verse 35, This land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden. Here is the promise of heaven. This is more than just a return from exile. This is heaven he's picturing for us. And and sometimes we think, this is what this is all about. It's about me getting into heaven. And that's it, full stop. And sometimes we're misguided to think, this is the goal. Of course it is part of this message. 
part of this new life. And this new life we validate by our behavior and our conduct to show that it is real, but it is not about ourselves. The full stop doesn't happen at the end of what we think of ourselves. Ezekiel knows this. Ezekiel reminds us here, as he conveys to us God's word, that this is all about God's glory. And your conversion is about God's glory. In verse 22, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name. Verse 23, I will vindicate the holiness of my great name. Out of his good pleasure, he saves you. But ultimately, everything is for God's glory. Your conversion is for God's glory. The gift of faith, the blessings and privileges that he has given to you. He saves a people out of his own good pleasure, but to exalt his own great name. Proverbs, of course, tells us that everything is for its day, even the wicked for its day. Even the wicked, to face the judgment of God, will bring glory to God. And how we see redemption, salvation, regeneration, as that which is fitting to bring glory to the great name of God. You see, the new birth is absolutely essential because we can never get into heaven without it. This is what we understand and know about salvation. And when we think and reflect upon this for ourselves, we're humbled. We don't deserve this. There is nobody in here who deserves God's saving activity. We are humbled that God would do this, that he would lay his hand upon us in his mercy and in his love, that he would give us life, that he would give us a new heart and a new spirit, that he would do this for us in our sin, in our rebellion, in our hard-heartedness. He looked upon us in mercy and love. We're humbled by what he has done for us, but we're evangelistic about it too. Because this is the message that the world needs to hear. This is the message of hope and light. This is the message of salvation. This is the message of God's power at work. This is the message that saves people. This is the message of hope. That you must be born again. And this is the confirmation of it too. This does happen. And this can happen to you. If it hasn't already occurred, it can happen to you. You're encouraged to seek it. You're being called here to contemplate upon this today, to think about what this is and to think about what it looks like and to see its absolute necessity. Because without it, you're lost. Anything less than this is not enough. And you're willing to go with a hard heart all the way to hell. When hope is extended. When an invitation is given. Where there is a promise of radical transformation. It's here. For you. In Christ. To seek him. While he is to be found. Because whatever else you are in your life, whatever other experience you've had, and whatever else you've achieved, and however many things you've done, if you're not born again, it's not enough. Never enough. Never, ever enough. You must be born again. You must experience this radical transformation. 
And when this comes, oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. Will you tonight, Christian friend, join me in praise? Because this is worthy of all our joy and all our celebration that God would give us this gift. And let us ensure that we do nothing to dilute this message, to lower this bad, to do anything to devalue the necessity of the new birth. Let us rather insist of the power of God at work in the soul of a person, that that is essential, that that is the way to salvation, and there is no other. There is no other. Amen. May the Lord bless our thoughts together. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you and bless you and praise you with the gratitude and thanksgiving of our heart for the great gift of faith. We pray that you would help us to have eyes that are always open, embracing our Saviour and turning away from our sins, walking in your statutes and in your rules, and embracing you fully with love and the realisation of your good pleasure towards us. May we glorify your holy name in our lives and in our conduct and our behaviour, that it will be consistent with the reality of the transformation that is radical and deep within us. Bless us then, we pray, and forgive us our sins in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll turn now to sing praise to God in Psalm 116 on page 154. Page 154, verses 1 to 9 of Psalm 116. Where we read these words. I love the Lord because he heard my voice. He listened when I cried to him for aid. I'll call on him as long as I shall live because he turned to hear me when I prayed. The cords of death gripped and entangled me. Upon me came the anguish of the grave. With grief and trouble I was overcome. Then on the name of God I called, Lord save. The Lord our God is kind, full of grace. Both righteous and compassionate is he. The Lord protects all those of childlike faith. When I was in great need, he rescued me. Rest, O my soul. God has been good to you. For you, O Lord, have saved my soul from death, my feet from stumbling, and my eyes from tears, that I may live for you while I have breath. Let's stand to sing these words and then we'll close with the benediction. I love the Lord because he heard my voice. He listened when I cried to him.
Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you.